I have a to-do list a mile long, but I got a question on Instagram in my direct messages that I really wanted to answer. And so I just decided to jump on and I'm live and no one's here but me because I didn't even tell anybody I was doing it. So the question was, a uh, teacher wrote, she lives in the Northeast in New England, and she has a fifth grade uh, student who is advanced in mathematics. And the school isn't really strong in meeting the needs of gifted kids, but this teacher wants to. And she reached out asking, do you have ideas for advancing and differentiating in math for a fifth grade student? And it turns out that I do. Now, I've written about this and in the description, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, in the description, there will be a link to an article I have on my website that is some ideas of differentiating for mathematics. In that case, the people were um, looking at sending a kid to actually college level math, which I personally have done with my one of my own children. So I'm fine with that. But that is what that specifically is. Although it, it does go into advancement for mathematics acceleration in general. What I'm going to be talking about now and whether anybody pops on and sees me or not. I see two people are here. Like if you're here, put it in the chat. Like I just like welcome because I just decided to jump on and talk about acceleration in mathematics. So I'm going to share so many ideas that I have for this teacher. And I thought that there would be others who could benefit from it. Now, even if you do not teach mathematics, I think that the principles behind this, the guiding ideas, the, the meta ideas behind this could help you with anything. And it doesn't really matter if it's fifth grade or kinder or 12th grade. So, well, hello from Jordan. So, um, welcome. All right. So I'm going to, oh, look, someone from New Jersey, Oklahoma. Oh, excellent. You know, I love Oklahoma. I live in Texas. And so Oklahoma is my neighbor. Um, we do have this Red River rivalry, but my one of my closest friends, an old army buddy actually, lives outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma in a small town called Inola. Um, okay. So I want to talk about differentiating for ability and interest in order to meet the needs of this student. So we have a fifth grader. In this case, it's a boy, but that doesn't matter. Um, gender doesn't matter with mathematics because the, you know, we all think the same, essentially. That's an oversimplification, but it doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl. All right, first, I want to look at differentiating by ability. So first of all, if we're going to differentiate because of ability, we believe this student is advanced in mathematics and we want to differentiate to meet that need, you're going to need to assess. And what I mean by that is you are going to need to do some pre-assessment. So you can do this globally uh, or you can funnel it down and get it very narrow. So let me describe what I mean by that. To do it globally, to assess globally, you could give some kind of abilities assessment, a COGAT, an OLSAT, something like that, that would give you, or even map testing, something that would give you an idea of where, I think you can tell by the way I said map testing, they're not, it, 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 that's looking at achievement, not necessarily ability. But in this case, when we've got a student who we're considering exempting or moving out of the normal pattern, a, achievement testing is valuable and valid because I can't, even if you have high ability, I can't have you skip the standards that you need to know um, just because you would like to, right? I need to have some data to show that this was a wise move, that it was pedagogically defensible. And so I'm going to do some kind of more global testing, abilities testing, achievement testing. I could also narrow that down a little bit. Maybe I give them a release. Like if I live in a state that releases the state assessment for the end of the year, maybe I give them a released fifth grade assessment. And so I see like how much of fifth grade um, of those standards, how well are they performing for the end of fifth grade? And if it's very high, I could end up even going further than that, right? I could do uh, end of sixth grade or something. I can get a feel for where is this kid? To, to narrow it down even more, I could give a unit test, 
of, of the unit that we're working on now and see where they stand there. So number one, you're going to have to do some pre-assessment. You can't just guess and you can't just go by what a parent says or what a kid says. You've got to have data. And the reason that you have to have data is because this is a bigger conversation than between the teacher and the parent. This is a, com and the student, this is a conversation that has to occur between the teacher, the parent, the student, and the administration, and then ultimately the school board, right? Because you can't, you can't just decide to exempt a kid from what is normal. So we're going to pretest. Then what we're going to do with that information is if we realize, oh, yes, actually, this kid does need something different than what we're going to be doing on a daily basis, then one of the things you're going to do is to plug the holes in the boat. So the phrase I use is plug the holes so you can set sail. What I mean by that is that you're going to give a kid an assessment and they may have a few places where the like sometimes people call it a gap, but I don't really think that's quite the right term. I would say like a hole. Um, and I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. One of my children, I'll call him Jonathan because that's his name. Um, Jonathan got tested in fifth grade for the end of seventh grade mathematics to see if he could take algebra in fifth grade. I think so. He must have been at the end of fourth grade. Anyway, somewhere in there, he takes the end of seventh grade assessment. And he got every single question correct with four. He missed four. And all of those four were the properties, right? Community property, associate property, distributed property. He didn't know the names of them. And that was just a hole in his learning, right? So what do we do? We plug that hole. We just teach that kid that thing and then let them go. So we're not going to say, oh, you don't know these. Therefore, you need to take the whole year to, to fill that one need. So we're going to plug that hole so we can set sail. You then have two choices. But, you know, what? I want to circle back to that pre-assessment because the pre-assessment may show that while everybody thought this kid was ready for advanced learning, they may not have been. And you need the data for that as well. That's another reason you need the data is because it might show that what was appearing anecdotally was not actually what was going on. And Jennifer's like, yes, you need that, right? So you need, in all cases, you need data. You need data to justify why you are doing what you're doing and why you are not doing what you're doing. The data will help you support, will support you in all both of those things. All right, next. So we've pre-tested, we're gonna plug holes, and then we're going to make a decision. Are we going to allow the student or encourage a student or invite the student, whatever word you want to use, to advance linearly, 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 or broadly? What do I mean by this? If we're going to have a student advance linearly, what we're going to say is, okay, well, you mastered the fifth grade content. So now we're going to have you work through sixth grade. Now, back to Jonathan, when he was in fourth grade, so when he was in third grade, he went down the hall and went to fourth grade for math. When he was in fourth grade, he went down the hall and went to fifth grade for math. But the fifth grade teacher realized he could move more quickly than the fifth grade was moving, put him in a, in a desk in the back corner of the room, and he worked through on his own in that class, the fifth grade textbook, sixth grade and seventh grade textbooks all in that year. And so he was advancing linearly that they were just moving him forward in math just keep going right so then he ends up taking ap calculus bc when he's like 13 or 14 right so that's a linear advancement we're just going to keep you on the same path that everyone else is on but we're going to let you move down that path at a quicker pace but we're not going we're not veering off of the path you're following the same standards you're going to you're just following them for an advanced level for you if you want to go more broadly then you're going to get into perhaps the background or the history or the ancillary information about what is being learned. So for example, a class is learning the quadratic formula to advance linearly. The students like, oh, I've already mastered this. I'm going to go on to some other 
uh, concept, but in another standard. But if you're going to advance broadly, then what you're going to do is let that kid do a very deep dive into the quadratic formula, much deeper than the rest of the students. They may read articles about the development of the quadratic formula. They may read a biography of the mathematicians who were involved in the development of it. They may read about any controversies that exist about the quadratic formula. They may go look at applications of the quadratic formula in real life ventures even today. They may do a study of a survey of people they know to find out who can still like draw the quadratic equation and then solve with it, right? So they're going to surround it like a fortress. They're going to build a fortress of learning. So rather than moving forward, they're going to stay where they are and they're going to build a fortress. So their knowledge of the quadratic formula or whatever it is, right? Ratio and proportion, even numbers, it doesn't matter because even if we're working with kinder, we can say, okay, this kid has already mastered what we're doing. We're going to let this child read some more books about um, something else related to this, books about numbers that are appropriate for them. So we can, in order, one of the ways to do that is to look at how that thing was covered in an old textbook or even a different level of textbook. Um, we may use MOOC courses, the massive online open courses that are free. Um, we may use great courses, those great courses, the, the, that's the name of them, great courses. They used to sell them on DVDs that they would mail to you. But now what I have found is that many, they're available in different ways. And many libraries, like my library has access to the great courses. And so you may have a student take a great course on an aspect of mathematics. So that is, that is what I would do to differentiate for ability. Now, let's say what I've decided is that the student, they I've done that pretest and they they are able to dif they are able to move somewhere else. They don't need what we're doing. I can say, look, you've already met these standards. You don't need to move forward. Like you you don't need to move forward and you don't even need to build a fortress. You can you can just explore mathematics. Like, let's just have fun leaning into the idea that you are you have a talent in math and you're going to develop that in a way that interests you. To do that, I would say you can just ask the student, like, is there anything about math that you already know you're interested in? If not, I've got some ideas. So here are some ideas for that. One would be TED Talks. If you just go to TED.com and in the search box, you put in math, it will pull up tons of talks about math and it will even pull up playlists like 11 great talks about math or, you know, 15 things about math that'll walk your world, right? And there are some fabulous TED Talks about math. You may also have them, and I mentioned this in the Fortress strategy, but you could also have them look at math from a more literary historical perspective, meaning maybe they're going to look at the, the history of mathematics, some histories of amazing mathematicians, some, and, and particularly like if the student is female, I would strongly suggest having them explore some of the biographies and information available on famous female mathematicians. So like Sofia Kovalevskaya or or just some who are lesser known and the, and the female mathematicians tend to be lesser known, but that's a wonderful place of interest-driven exploration. Um, you, you also can look at where does math intersect with the student's interests? So for example, let's say the student is interested in art. They like to draw. Well, obviously mathematics and art intersect in so many ways and not just the obvious like the, the golden ratio and the Fibonacci thing, not just that. There are lots of other ways in which math and, and art and photography all blend together. It may intersect with music. If they're interested in music, they can do some exploration of the intersectionality of math and music or sports or gaming, game theory, right? Whatever the student is interested in. And even if their student is a 
like a big reader. Then we have things like in fifth grade, I would recommend The Devil's Arithmetic novel or The Phantom Toll Booth. There are novels that have mathematic, um, I was going to say a mood, and I guess that's it. It's like the topic of the novel, not necessarily, but it's a driving force. And so if their interest is, if they're interested in, in reading, you can connect them with books that have math as a central theme or a through line. One of the things to consider is the idea of independent study. And independent study is where their interests and their ability will cross. So independent study can be done to either um, move them forward linearly, like we discussed, where they're going to progress through the content, or um, to let them build that fortress of learning, or it can be done on uh, just their interest driven, right? The, their interests that are driving them. So I want to give you some examples of what I mean by interest driven study. So we talked about where their personal interests might intersect with mathematics, with music, art, sports, gaming, whatever. But I want to mention some topics in mathematics that are quite interesting and that might lend themselves to a good independent study. Now, one of the reasons I'm a big fan of independent study is that in independent study, students can move at their own pace, which is great, but they're also going to develop the strategies of scholar, of being a scholar, right? Scholarly skills. They're going to learn executive function skills like managing their time, their materials. They're going to learn how to perform mentally uh, in actual production in a way that matches perhaps their ability. So I'm a big believer in independent study. Now, here are some of the concepts that I think in mathematics lend themselves to this because I think they're interesting and it depends on the age of student or not necessarily their chronological age, but the mental age of the student, whether they're, whether these are appropriate for them, but you can, you can decide that with the parent. So one of the things that's really quite interesting are platonic solids. So platonic solids, and some of you are like, uh, were you an English teacher? Why do you know all this math? Well, uh, I taught math in elementary school when I taught elementary school, but also I took math in college. I took statistics. I took, I took lots of math. So, and I, I love math. I'm a math enthusiast, right? So um, platonic solids are really quite interesting. Platonic solids are these shapes where no matter what direction you look at them from, they all, they look exactly the same and they're really quite fascinating. And there is also this plate folding circle plate folding where you can make like tetrahedrons and make a bunch of um, things out of that. I had a book on it. You can, you can find this book on eBay or Amazon, but I gave the book and a stack of paper plates to my friend's kids when we had like snow days and they built huge structures out of these. So you can, these, these platonic solids and exploring these geometric shapes, especially three-dimensional geometric shapes like tetrahedrons, dodecahedrons, these things, lots of stuff can be done with that. That's really quite fun. Um, next, they might be interested in exploring logic. Um, and I mean the logic that is math-based logic, right? If P, then Q. If not P, then not Q. Those syllogistic, logical syllogisms that are actual logic, not logic in the sense of, does that make sense, but rather logical argument. Interestingly, that will help them later on if they take AP Lang, because that's going to be exploring logic of argument. So logic is a fun one. Statistics are super fun. And that's a place where you're going to be able to find lots of stuff on on TED, on Khan Academy, on YouTube, right? Just YouTube is a wealth of, of information on different topics in mathematics. Um, so statistics are one that are, are, statistics is so fun to explore and I highly recommend it. Next is fractals. So I watched a TED talk one time that was about how villages in Africa, when you look at them from above, like from a satellite, that they're set up in fractals. It was fascinating, right? So exploring fractals and there's even sites online where you can plug stuff in and it'll generate fractals. But looking at fractals is one place that might be interesting to students. Cryptography. So whether they 
watch movies about code breaking. Like we just had just the other day at the time I'm filming this, it was like the other day was Navajo Code Talkers Day. So maybe they're interested in that or maybe they're interested in Enigma when the British broke the German code during World War II. Maybe they're interested in learning like spy coding and, and maybe they're interested in creating a code or learning how to break codes. Cryptography is a fabulous place of interest. And um, another one I would recommend is like prime numbers. Prime numbers are so interesting. There's so many things in the patterns of prime numbers they could get into, like the twin prime conjecture and lots of things like that. And so one of the things I think as a teacher, it behooves you to find out, like, what are some things in math in general that are interesting and make some little blurb about them so that, you know what, I, I need to do this for you. I need to do this for you. I'm going to make a note. Go do this for them so that there's a little blurb for students so they could look at it and go, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. And that's what I want to do. And I didn't do this so that I could add more to my to-do list. <laughs> anyway, okay, but it's a good idea. Um, next, geography in nature. So there's a lot of geography in nature, a lot of mathematics in nature. And so that would be, and not just like there's Fibonacci in nature, obviously, but there's specifically geometry in nature that is worth exploring. Um, maybe have them, if they're interested in a different number system, like the Mayan number system or the Babylonian number system, or even becoming experts in the Roman numeral system. Like there are other number systems. Our, we use Arabic numerals uh, in in the United States and most Western country, like we're using Arabic numerals, but that is not the only numbering system. So that's another place. And then the last one I'd say is like graph theory. So there are just a lot of concepts within mathematics and I could go on forever, but there are a lot of concepts within mathematics that are interesting. Oh, a part of the logic that's interesting is not just doing the like if P then Q, but also doing the kind of like where if you have 15 people on the side of the river and you have a canoe and you have to get them all over, what's the fastest way? Those kind of logic puzzles are also a really fun thing to explore in mathematics. So those are interest-driven ideas. Now, so we've talked about differentiating based on ability. We've talked about the importance of pretesting. We've talked about how you can either advance linearly or you can go broadly. And I discussed that fortress strategy. And if you're if you're just joining in, you, you know, this recording will be up and you can go watch it. But I want to kind of wrap this up with talking about what then. So they've done this thing, whether they are advancing linearly, whether you are doing the fortress strategy, whether you're doing purely interest driven, um, whether you're doing independent study, how do you wrap this up? Well, first of all, I would say that you have to plan for assessment. Now, I don't mean grades. I mean assessment. A student who has already mastered the standards of the grade level should not be punished for that mastery by being forced to do a bunch more work that can punish them, right? You can't have a kid. I've seen this happen. It doesn't make any sense where a kid has mastered the fifth grade standards. They let them work on sixth grade math and then they lower their grades. So that kid who mastered fifth grade standards has a lower grade in the class than other kids who haven't mastered them. That makes no sense. That's pedagogically indefensible. You can't do that. What you can do is say, okay, on the pretest, you scored, um, you know, X, you scored a 94. All right, we're going to plug that in as your grade for everything. But we're going to go ahead and give you some extra points on that for all this other stuff you're doing, right? You can do that. That's fine. But I'm not is actually talking about grading. I'm talking about, I'm talking about evaluation and about having the learning have a point, having some kind of demonstration of learning. And so there are a few things you can do for this. So if you're advancing linearly, it's built in, right? You're, you take the next test. Okay. If you are doing the fortress one or you're doing interest-driven or independent study, you're going to need something else. And I think this is where the student should decide. The student should decide, how do you want to show me what you've been working on? And this isn't a gotcha. This isn't, how are you going to show me what you've been working on? so that I can critique it and criticize you. No, it is, 
I'm interested in what you're doing. So how can the teacher and parents learn about what the child learned and explore? And the, the point of exploration, like explorers keep diaries, right? Because we want to know what you did and whether it's drawing or, or writing or however you're presenting it. So some ideas, um, maybe they keep a journal of learning. Um, maybe they can, and if it, and if it's math, I would suggest that the journal be on graph paper so that they can sketch out some of the mathiness that they're doing and have it feel kind of like a field journal, right? You want that feel. I don't mean a journal in today. What I learned was blank, but rather let them explore some of the journals of Leonardo da Vinci and some of the other great mathematicians. I mean, a lot of really good journals are available online from famous people who were experts in their field. Let the kid look at that and get a feel for it, a feel for it, that that field journal feel. Um, like a commonplace book almost of mathematics. Next, you could actually have them write a little book. Now, desktop publishing is super easy now. And even if it's as simple as just taking a piece of paper, I'm looking around for like a blank piece of paper. Here we go. It's not blank, but I'll show you what I mean. I have um, one of my favorite pieces of uh, one of my favorite school supplies is a booklet stapler that allows you to put paper like this and staple here and here. If you watched my video on things to buy a kindergarten teacher, you saw that. So here and here. So maybe the book is four pages. It's like two pieces of notebook paper that are, you know, stapled here. And they've made a little tiny book about what they learned about platonic solids, right? You need to produce. You need to produce. Everybody needs to produce. If you have nothing to show for your efforts, it's demoralizing. All right. So they could produce a little book like that, or they could write something up in even just word, save it as a PDF, upload it somewhere. Next, you could have them build a catalog of options for students who come after them. When um, this is an example from language arts, but the principle is the same. When I, sorry, I'm like shaking my desk. Sorry about that. Um, in the, um, thank you, Jennifer. I, I really appreciate like the uh, comments that come through, especially because I like literally just jumped on to do this. And so it's really nice. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, and and she, I think she's saying so, so true to my point that you need something to show for your efforts. And it's, and this is especially, I wanna, so I wanna go back and talk about that for a second because it's especially true when you're deviating from the norm. When you're deviating from the norm and you don't have the thing that everybody else has, you need something because other people are going to be like, what are you really doing? Like, you're just goofy. I'm like, you're going down the hall to the library. Like, what is this? Right. But when you have something to show for it, there's a sense of there. There's a growing sense of self-worth. There's a growing sense of um, that. I am doing something worthwhile. This isn't just a joke. This isn't just like. This isn't just something to keep me busy because I already knew what everybody else knew. It's like I'm actually learning something. And that is part of how we demonstrate that development of those skills of scholarism. Is scholarism? I don't even know if that's a word. I may have just made it up. But, you know, English is cool that way. So put, 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 put the ending on it and there it is. Right. Thank you, Latin. So uh, the other thing that it does, though, is that. It gives the student something to look back on and say, I did this. And it also is part of how we develop those executive function skills that I mentioned earlier. So having something to show for your work is part of how we feel like we're not just creating in a void. And we need that feeling. We need that feeling of accomplishment. So I'm going to give you the example from one of my high school English classes. But I think the example works for any content area and almost any grade level. I would say, I'm trying to think of my third graders. The earliest grade I've actually taught like all day, every day is third. I've worked with younger kids, but not in, not as their teacher of record. Um, I don't, I don't know. I had very few third graders who could do this. However, I would say that what we're talking about is people who have very rare ability. So this is what I mean. I in 10th grade, uh, I would get students the second semester who had had pre-AP English the semester before, but had dropped it at semester and were coming into regular English and they came into my regular English class. Uh, in the school 
the geniuses who were running it decided that they that the pre-AP should do Julius Caesar in the fall and regular students should do Julius Caesar in the spring. It makes no sense because then those kids drop at semester, they come in and they've already read the first thing we're going to read. It's annoying in the extreme. And so what I did was I looked at the list of all the things that were like approved to teach that we were not teaching. And there was another play called The Fantastics that was on our list. And so what I did was I had this group of students. I tested them out of Julius Caesar. Not all of them tested out, but I had them test out of Julius Caesar. And then I said, OK, what you guys are going to do. And I think I had five or six of them. And I said, what you guys are going to do is you are going to develop a unit on the fantastics. And I gave them criteria like I want you to create like I want you to have some backstory, like an introduction to it to get people interested in it. Like if I learned this about the Fantastics, I'd want to read the play or see the play. And then I want you to go through the play and create activities for students your grade level to do with the play. And then I want an assessment as well. And I had all these different things. I wanted them to create a movie poster for it. I wanted them to create like all this different stuff. And those students worked together while we were doing Julius Caesar for like four weeks. They worked together and created this unit on the Fantastics. The following year, the students who tested out of Julius Caesar did that unit. And so one of the things you can do is have them create something that other students could use. And that's where that's where there's some real power. When you create something to show what you learn, that's great. But when you create something to show what you learned that other people can actually use and benefit from, then you're going to get all the feels. So there's some good research that shows that our self-concept, our what mostly would be called self-esteem, how good we feel about ourselves, in large part has to do with how much we agree, how strongly we agree with this statement I'm pretty good at doing a lot of things. It doesn't really have to do with I'm smart or I'm pretty or, you know, I'm strong. It has to do with I'm pretty good at doing a lot of things. And so what we want is to have students create things where they can demonstrate a skill because that will feed their soul. That will strengthen them. That will develop their self-concept, not only in mathematics, but generally, and a lot of gifted kids struggle with their self-concept. And so this is a way to do that. So this teacher who reached out and asked me for some advice on differentiating for fifth grade math student probably did not expect me to get on and talk for however long I've been talking. But I hope that these ideas have been helpful. And again, in the description, there is a link to where you can go read about it, about another article that I have about this similar topic. And so if you are, if you have questions about accelerating mathematics, you can put it in the comments. I'll see it, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, you can obviously shoot me an email um, or I'm, I'm more often on Instagram. So if you want to reach me on Instagram, I'm at, at the gifted guru. And thank you for your interest in accelerating your students in mathematics, because any teacher who sends me a message saying, how do I help this kid? That's a teacher after my own heart. And I have a bunch more questions that have come in in the live stream. So I'll be going live again next week. I'll actually let people know when I'm doing it. So thank you so much. And if you are interested in gifted ed, if you are someone who is a teacher or parent and wants to meet the needs of gifted students, make sure you subscribe and get that notification bell so that you know when I'm going to be talking about specific things that you might be interested in and whether you watch them live or whether you come back. So Jennifer, thank you for joining in with me today. And all of you who were here when I just jumped in, I really appreciate you spending this time with me and I hope it was valuable to you. So thank you so, so much.